I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess I had a much broader goal in mind before I started making the talk. I was going to give you an overview of the field of um, social network mining and all the statistical challenges and opportunities that we have, um, and then realize that that would take me probably all day to give you that talk. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is um, talk about, uh, I guess very briefly, about three different projects that um, I have some of my students working on. To, uh, that's one of them here in the audience, and uh, to give you a sense of the kinds of open questions, um, theoretical questions that there are in this area, and how it maybe would interact with, um, you know, other people's work in the SDC. So um, here is the uh, sort of roadmap to the kind of data that we do a lot of work on. This is uh, uh, so Facebook has obviously um, changed the face of. Uh, research on um, social and behavioral uh, interactions among people uh, based on the amount of data that they have available. So a lot of the social interactions that used to go on uh, offline where people couldn't see them, uh, it was much harder for sociologists and uh, social psychologists to study this uh, kind of behavior. But now there's a huge amount of information that's being posted on Facebook um, every day. and um, some of this we can see easily and some of it we can't. These statistics are probably out of date because I went to get these from Facebook maybe like two years ago. But they're just there to give you a sense of the enormity of the data that's available in terms of friends and information that they pass from one another to uh, how they talk to each other, they um, take pictures, which gives evidence of their um, behaviors together um, offline. And there's a lot of information that uh, Social, a broad range of social scientists are trying to um, study to change the uh, kinds of patterns uh, or, or theories that they can develop about human interaction from this kind of data. And so from a machine learning or um, statistics perspective, what uh, we need to think about are what are the statistical challenges to model and analyze this kind of uh, data in order to make sure that the social scientists can actually find accurate patterns um, from the data instead of ina inaccurate patterns, okay? And so um, a couple of the challenges are, first of all, um, so I guess I pasted the slide in here, OSN uh, is a short for um, online social network. Um, the first challenge is that the size of the data is uh, just eclipses the kind of data sets that social scientists have looked at in the past. And here's an example of the kind of network that they looked at in the past. This is from the um, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, where they went to uh, uh, I think grade schools up to high school, and they went into the classrooms, and they actually asked people manually who were your friends. And then they constructed social networks from that, where um, you could easily visualize the network and see certain patterns um, from the data itself. So here are um, the kids in, I think, a seventh grade uh, classroom. And so uh, the nodes are circles or squares according to what gender the, um, the kid is. And so you can guess from this that the friendships are clustering based on gender. Right? And so, in fact, these are um, girls and these are boys. So there's a lot more friendships among the girls than there are among the boys. There's some strange outlier out here, um, <laughs> number 10, uh, who uh, is, maybe has some interesting uh, friendship patterns to look at. But the, the point of uh, putting this up here is that this is the size of the graph that they, that they would look at. You know, 22 nodes, 53 edges. All you have to do is graph it and you can see a lot of information from the data. Um, now, if you look at instead the Purdue Facebook network, you get something like this, right? And actually, um, this was the Purdue Facebook network, the publicly visible Purdue Facebook network in 2008, so it's bigger than this, and actually I'm pointing to it like this is actually a Purdue Facebook network. Um, what we looked at, uh, when we looked at it, there were 56,000 nodes and over 3 million edges, and we can't even graph that, so this is actually a subset um, which refers to the class of 2011, which is a little bit smaller, but still when you graph it, you see that there's just, just this huge blob. You can no longer see any patterns in that data. And so um, one of the challenges is 
to be able to develop automatic methods that can analyze this kind of data because we can no longer visually inspect it and find some patterns. Okay. So another challenge is that um, this is this is also a different view of that um, class of 2011 network where um, what I'm showing you here is the nodes are colored according to their political views. So the um, we have some nodes have identified themselves as being conservative, some nodes are liberal, and then these sort of teal colored nodes are the ones that uh, we, do, we can't, they either haven't put down their political views or we can't see them because they're private. And one of the uh, big successes in relational learning over the last 10 years is that we've developed classification methods that we can learn a statistical model of the dependencies across friendships um, in this network, uh, exploiting the fact that people who are friends tend to have similar political views or similar attributes. And then based on that, we can learn the dependencies from the labeled data, and we can use that to infer the labels of uh, the unlabeled nodes in the network. But if you look at the structure of this network, um, it's very heterogeneous. Well, I guess you can't really see the edges at all because of the lighting here. But um, it's very heterogeneous. So this person in the middle is linked to almost everybody. Um, so there's some people with hundreds of friends, some people with a couple of friends. And this combination of this varying structure of the network, and, uh, as well as the statistical dependencies among the nodes, um, greatly complicates our efforts to both learn accurate statistical models uh, uh, conduct accurate hypothesis tests, and it also makes it very difficult for us to characterize what the models and the algorithms are doing theoretically, because we have a hard time uh, ana analytically uh, characterizing what this structure is. Okay, and so I'm going to get into that more in, um, in, in detail in, uh, later in the talk, so we'll come back to that. So. Basically, what we um, work on in, in my lab is what, what I would call social network mining. So we want to develop algorithms and methods to be able to automatically analyze these kind of large-scale heterogeneous um, social network data, and also to be able to say things about how to uh, how to have good methodology and accurate um, hypothesis tests or evaluations of the the methods that we develop. Okay, so. Um, to differentiate this from a lot of the work that has been done in the last 20 years of machine learning, uh, we uh, most of the work in machine learning um, has been, uh, particularly the theoretical analysis, has been in this uh, in a, in working on data where we can assume that the instances are IID. So IID is independent and identically distributed. So that would be if we took the nodes in the network and we just analyze the characteristics of the nodes in isolation, assuming that there's no dependencies between uh, the nodes in the network. And so that would be what we call an IID setting. And here we want to transform it to explicitly consider the links among the nodes in the network under the assumption that the pairs of linked nodes are likely to be more, uh, well, we're going to use that to constrain this Based on possible statistical dependencies, so that we don't have to consider all pairwise statistical dependencies of everybody in the network, because of course that would be totally intractable. Um, but where this gives us a subset of dependencies that are likely to exist in the data. Okay. So the key characteristic here that we want to exploit in the data is that there are these dependencies between the nodes, but that that key characteristic is going to be what complicates the statistical analysis as well. Okay. So here's how we would formulate that um, in an abstract setting is that we have a graph here where the nodes are entities, and on the entities we have some observed attributes x, which could be, say, the gender of the people, their hometown location, um, you know, whether or not they're student, faculty, staff, and then we have some class level here that we might want to predict um, about the nodes. Uh, which is maybe, you know, whether or not they're conservative, um, whether or not they're um, uh, involved in fraud, something like that. And then they're connected in a graph based on the relationships between um, the people, the expressed relationships, like the friendship relationships in the social network. And then what we want to do is estimate a model that, of the joint distribution of the class labels. 
laid out over the graph conditioned on the observed attributes we have in the network and the graph structure that we have. Okay, so that's uh, the problem formulation. Um, sometimes uh, people will estimate this as a conditional distribution of a particular um, class label of node i given the observed attributes of that node i, the observed attributes of its neighbors, and the observed attributes of its uh, of the observed class labels of those neighbors. Okay? So that's the kind of setting that we um, are in when we want to do attribute prediction in these relational social networks. And here are the statistical, some of the statistical challenges that have already been dealt with in the last, say, 10, 10 years of work in this area. The first main challenge is that we often do learning from a single data graph. Okay, so it's very different from the common um, machine learning setting where you have multiple independent examples that you can learn a model from. So when you have uh, one data graph, then you really only have one example. But the idea that we've used is that um, really the instances you have over here in the graph are probably somewhat independent of these instances that you have over here in the graph. So if we learn a model where we tie the parameters together across the model, then we can exploit that uh, amount of inf uh, information throughout the graph to actually, do, uh, to actually learn the model. The second challenge we have is that, uh, what I mentioned before, we have heterogeneous graph structure. So somebody might have 100 friends, somebody else has two friends, and so we have to be able to deal with that heterogeneity. And the two ways that the models deal with it now is they either use aggregation to um, put everything, you should stand right in the light, um, to collapse everything into a homogeneous representation, or we use um, what's called repeated um, templates in the model, uh, where we roll out, we take a particular template and we roll it out as many times as we need to across the heterogeneous structure, which I'll show you in a, in a later slide. And finally, the last uh, challenge is that you have these dependencies between the instances so you can't learn, you can't estimate the parameters in the same way you would when you have independent examples. And so um, one of the ways to deal with that is that we learn a joint model now. And of course, um, the, uh, that brings up issues in terms of uh, computational efficiency versus accuracy trade-offs because as you learn a joint model, the size of the space that you're doing search over to learn the model grows with the size of the data. And so actually making um, approximations of this might uh, result in an okay model with a large increase in computational efficiency. Okay, so we have two basic scenarios. Um, I guess I, this is in, in response to this uh, uh, challenge of there being a single data graph, I just want to highlight um, that the opposite of that is that you even though you have a relational graph structure, some of the work has gone on in uh, learning models in domains where you actually have many graphs, and so that you can reason about the characteristics of the um, algorithms and the models, uh, assuming that you get more and more of those graph structures. So the, um, an example would be here in the, um, in the Adolescent Health Survey, they have one social network that corresponds to each classroom that they did this survey in. And so you can imagine, even though you're learning a model of, say, one graph, you can imagine some scenario in the real world where you get more and more examples of those classroom structures. Right? So you can reason about the um, as and taught learning algorithms uh, by thinking about uh, the possibility that you get an infinite number of those school samples. Right? So that you get it eventually, you get an infinite number of networks. Um, so all of the work for the last ten years, um, when there's any kind of theoretical analysis about the performance of the algorithms, it's been under this assumption that somehow you can get more and more data, an infinite amount of separate networks. That then, because they're separate, you can reason about them in the same way you would independent examples. Okay. But in reality, most of the cases where we apply the algorithms, and I should say that we get very good empirical results from applying them in these settings where there's one big large graph. Right? And so then the asymptotic um, characteristics of this problem 
correspond to getting a larger and larger size graph. Right? So when you get more data from Facebook, you don't get another independent network, you just get more and more data from Facebook. Right? So the size of the graph grows infinitely, and, and although we're busy applying our algorithms in this setting and have been for many years, there's been no theoretical work characterizing when is it okay to do this, and what are the characteristics of the domain that affect the performance of, of the model in this situation. Okay? So, um, so I have a student, Ram Jay, who has just um, done some work on, on trying to uh, do the first theoretical analysis of a particular kind of estimation, um, uh, I guess estimation for a class of, of models um, and in order to characterize the conditions under which the estimation is actually well formulated um, for these single network domains. And the setting that we're considering here is where you have this one big network, and what we're going to do is we're going to learn the model from some training subnetwork of this large, potentially infinite sized graph, and we're going to learn a model from that. This is a fully labeled um, network where we, the pluses and minuses correspond to the class label that we're trying to estimate the model over. And we would want to learn the model on some fully labeled network and then apply it to some other part of the network where we may know some of the labels that we want to jointly infer the rest of the labels in the network. Okay? But um, what we're focusing on is not the inference, not the applying it for prediction in the other part of the network, but what about the characteristics of learning in this setting. So <laughs> the class of models that um, we consider are what we call um, Markovian relational models. Okay, so there's a number of different models here that fall into this um, category. So relational Markov networks, Markov logic networks, and relational dependency networks are all examples of these um, kind of models where what we do is we take this structure of the graph and we're going to formulate it um, as a Markov network where we have clique templates that are repeated um, over the network and we're going to tie the parameters of the clique templates of the same type in the network. So for example, we might have um, edgewise cliques here that get laid over um, every pair of linked nodes in this network. So for every pair of friends, you would just have the same clique template repeated over the whole network. Or we have node-centric which uh, involve a particular node and all of its neighbors. Okay? And so the main idea here is that um, when you um, repeat this template over top of every possible um, scenario in this network, they're going to be overlapping and potentially of different size. Right? And so these models um, deal with that, um, but the math of the model is really just great comes down to this because it's a Markov network. So we have here this, um, we have this joint probability distribution over the labeling of the instances in the graph. So that's the class labels of all the instances. And then here are, uh, we're now gonna have a product over the clique, um, the types of clique templates, right? So whether or not um, the pairwise would be one type of clique template and the node centric would be another type of clique template. And then here is now we have a product over all the cliques and then we're going to have the clique potential um, for that, uh, which is just this log linear function um, over here. And so if we just assume that we have only one type of template to make it easier, for example, just the pairwise cliques, then you get this um, natural um, formulation here of a Markov network where we have this exponential function of the parameter values and the clique templates. Right? So these are features of the attribute values in the cliques. So in terms of asymptotic analysis, what we're interested in here is that the model grows with the number of cliques that we have. Right? So as the size of the network grows, if you think about this growing, um, you're going to have more and more examples of this pairwise clique template. So the size of this is going to grow um, with the number of cliques and also the size of this um, normalization uh, uh, factor here is going to grow infinitely. And so how can we characterize that learning is going to be um, asymptotically uh, consistent in this kind of framework? What you have to do is formulate 
what it means to have your graph grow to the infinite size to, to define that learning is sort of well formed in this scenario. Okay, so I'm not going to go over to the details of all the proofs that we have, but we've out uh, just the, I'll just hit the high level ideas here that we had to define the conditions under which we could prove that the estimators were going to be asymptotically consistent and normal in this scenario where the graph is growing infinitely. Okay, so the um, so the main limitation here is that the uh, typical ways of uh, analyzing um, estimation in these models uh, don't work for dependent data in general. Right? So there's some work on specifying the conditions for different types of dependent data um, where estimation is going to be consistent, but uh, not specifically any that would apply to this case where you have one single network that is growing to infinite size. Okay? So what we had to do is formalize our um, intuitively what people use to justify the empirical application of the algorithms that we've been doing so far in relational learning. And one is that you have bounded degree, right? So the idea is that, you know, if your graph is growing of infinite size, really if you look around you to your local neighborhood, you have some fixed number of friends. And just because there's a, the population is growing in the world does not mean that your number of friends is actually going to grow infinitely as well, right? So there's some sort of uh, upper level at which you're not going to change your little social network structure around you in the neighborhood, right? And so that's the first thing that we'll formalize. The second idea is this idea of weak dependence, um, which is also the intuition that I referred to when I said the stuff over here in the graph is probably not dependent on the stuff over here in the graph, right? And so that's what we've um, sort of said to each other for many years, but nobody's really formulated that um, up until this point. So here's how we formulated it in order to do the analysis. So um, what you have to do is actually uh, specify that this uh, model of infinite size is actually going to be well formed. And so we have these two conditions is that um, there's some upper bound for the degree of each node's Markov blanket, which again is really just its neighborhood. And also that the feature values themselves are going to be bounded. So just because the size of the model grows doesn't mean that your feature values are going to um, change infinitely as well. And then for the weak dependence, um, what we specified is that the total covariance of any clique, so clique template in the graph, um, the total covariance of that clique with all other cliques in the in the model is finite. Okay, so even though the model size is going to be growing infinitely as the data graph grows, that you won't end up having infinite variance with uh, with everything else in the graph. Okay, so that sort of is based on this idea that what's going to happen is your covariance with other cliques is going to decay as you go further and further away from you in the graph. Okay? And so um, given these two uh, assumptions or conditions, then we can relatively easily show that um, things are asymptotically consistent and normal in terms of estimation. So these are sufficient conditions but not necessarily not necessarily necessary conditions. Not necessary conditions, okay? So I'm not going to um, go into the details of the proof, but uh, if you want to know more about the paper, um, the main idea is that once we define these conditions of local finiteness and dependence, then we can show that estimation is okay. So it basically shows that under these conditions, everything we've been doing empirically for the last five years is okay to do, but we don't actually know when the conditions hold or not, okay? So the main issue here is with respect to weak dependence, okay? So we have this um, notion of weak dependence that we defined, but it's not the only notion. It's not the only way you can define weak dependence, and it's actually computationally infeasible to actually compute whether or not it holds, okay? And so the, the difficulty in formulating these weak dependence conditions are due to the fact that the model structure, right, in terms of what are the clique potentials in the model, interact with the graph structure in order to 
determine whether or not the weak dependence holds, right? Because the model structure is going to be rolled out over graph structures, right? And you don't really know as you're growing infinitely what's the characteristics of the graph structure that you're going to get as you're growing the graph, right? And so, you know, hold them talk. Um, I could give on how we don't actually know how to specify a probabilistic model of graph structure that works <laughs> uh, very well. Um, so that's a whole other open area of research, but um, with respect to this issue, the question is how to characterize how the graph structure interacts with the model in order to decide without having to look at the data and empirically test the um, relationships whether or not these conditions hold. Okay, and so that's sort of the open um, theoretical question uh, still left in this area. And I guess in terms of wrapping up this section, I would say that so far there's been really a very little theoretical analysis of these algorithms that everybody's developing and applying to things like Facebook data or Twitter data in practice. Um, but as we've, in my group, um, started to try to dig into these uh, questions, we found that it's, it's very hard to actually characterize all the dimensions um, in, in a way that's feasible given that we have really one network um, to work with. Okay, so, so it's actually hard because of this combination of the network structure and the model structure work together to define these dependencies, but also because learning and prediction are often intertwined together because we are learning in this partially labeled single network. Okay? So there's a lot of work to be done in this um, direction in terms of um, developing generalization bounds or decomposing the um, error that we have in our model and associating with different parts of the um, learning and inference process, and also to develop methods for what uh, are called <coughs> um, active learning and active inference, which is if you are working in this big graph, can you decide where you should acquire more information to make this whole process go faster, um, better, more accurate, right? And, um, Initial work in the area of active learning and inference has shown that um, just picking things to label based on the graph structure alone is not, is not the most accurate way to do it, and that's probably because there's this combination of the graph structure with the model structure that work together to decide where are these um, strong dependencies in the network. Right? So we have to do a lot more work to figure out what's going on there. Okay, so now I will, uh, any questions on that before I switch to a slightly different topic? Okay, so another issue where we're sort of on shaky um, theoretical ground is with respect to network sampling. And um, what we want to do with network sampling is um, think about the case that we have this single large graph <coughs> and the graph is too large for us to either acquire or we can't see it because some of it is private or because it's just too large to actually run in any of our algorithms on. So most analysis is done on some sample from this larger network. And one question is how to actually do this sampling well. And so that's considering that you actually have the option to sample yourself and get certain kinds of data from the larger network but this analysis of sampling algorithms will also tell us if somebody's just given us a sample, how, uh, how much we can trust the analysis based on understanding what the properties are of the sampling algorithms and how they impact um, the analysis. So what, when we start working on sampling, there's actually quite a few papers on developing sampling algorithms for networks, but nobody really clearly states what the objective is. Um, so as computer scientists, we just say, oh, look, we're trying to sample, and um, here we have an algorithm that does it. But if you, uh, it, it became clear that there's actually two different goals of um, sampling from these large networks, and different algorithms are going to work uh, differently with respect to these two goals. One is that you might want to get an estimate of the parameters or characteristics of the larger graph but only using a smaller graph structure, right? So for example, you want to compute the degree distribution on the much larger graph, but you only want to do it with a small number of nodes, so how do you select the best number of nodes to get you an unbiased 
estimate of that degree distribution on the larger graph. Okay, so that's the first um, goal. The second goal is that you actually want to sample a subgraph with representative structure, right? Because you're going to learn models on the smaller subgraphs, or you're going to develop a routing protocol for these smaller subgraphs, and you want to observe their behavior on the smaller subgraph and generalize, hope that generalizes to the larger graph that you don't have access to or it's too inefficient to actually run things on that larger graph, okay? So what we're going to focus on is actually this uh, question of uh, how to sample a representative <coughs> subgraph because um, it's much less clear how to do this effectively because you have to consider the characteristics of the induced subgraph that's formed. So, um, so before I tell you about the algorithms, um, let me first tell you that there is an open issue about how to evaluate representativeness if you get these subgraphs. So what typically happens in papers is that you see things, so they pick a couple of um, different metrics to observe, to measure on the larger graph. So here the black line would be the, in this case, the degree distribution on the larger original graph. And then you get a couple of sampling algorithms, they sample a smaller subgraph, and then um, they graph the distributions from those smaller subgraphs, and they say, look, the blue one matches the black one more closely, so this must be the best sampling algorithm. Okay? And the thing to note here is that this is an indirect evaluation of whether or not the sample is representative, because it assumes that on the smaller subgraph, well, for, it assumes two things. First, it assumes that measuring the degree distribution, that somehow that's a, that measures representativeness, right? And the second thing it assumes is that the, the metric that you look at, whether it's degree distribution, path length, clustering coefficient, that on a smaller subgraph that you could actually observe the same distribution you saw on the larger graph. Right? So it's something that nobody has uh, really considered up until this point, um, but well, oh, let me wait on saying that to you, uh, give you guys more information. So here's the general idea on how, uh, on how graph sampling methods work. So there's three basic classes of sampling algorithms. One, the first one would be called node sampling, where you randomly sample some set of nodes from this larger graph, and then you add all associated edges among those nodes. Right? So that's the simplest one that's been around a long time. Edge sampling is an analogous um, sampling method, but with respect to edges. So you just randomly sample edges from this larger graph and then hook them up however they happen to you from your random selection. And then a third class um, is called topology sampling, where you basically do some kind of random walk through the graph and you just pick up what you see when you're doing your random walk. Okay? So in terms of the statistical properties of these, um, you have to, if you use these methods to form a subgraph that you're going to consider for, um, for analysis, you have to consider the properties that will result in the, um, in the induced subgraph. So if you think of node sampling, what you can see is if you've randomly selected the nodes, then the node selection is unbiased in this sampling method. But because all you're going to do is, if you sample nodes and then you get all edges among the set of sampled nodes, then you can't possibly get the degree you had in the original graph, right? So if you sample 20% of the nodes, probably 20% of your neighbors are gonna end up in the sample, so you're gonna have an other estimate of the degrees of these nodes in the induced subgraph. So the degrees will be underestimated, right? So even, the node, even though the node selection is unbiased, the degrees will be underestimated. Here in edge sampling, the edge selection is unbiased, but node selection itself is biased because if you have more edges coming out of you, you're going to be more likely to be sampled because you sample the edges randomly. Okay, so it ten, edge selection tends to select things that were high degree in the original graph. However, then because it's only adding in the edges that it selects overall connectivity is biased in these kind of samples. And so most people, connectivity is so far underestimated that most people never consider edge sampling as a, as a method to use, because it's so very bad um, in terms of the properties of the induced subgraph. Yeah. Uh, now we are still under the idea that the representativeness is by edge distribution. 
Yeah, so generally we measure it by distribution on several graph metrics, like um, degree distribution, um, half length distribution, hot plots, um, uh, clustering coefficient, maybe eigenvalue distribution. So that so because we don't have a good way of measuring representativeness, people generally say, well, here's another metric that we should match, right? So you could have 10, 12 metrics that you say we should match on all of these, but that's that's the best that people have right now. So topology sampling would be an example of what's called convenience sampling in the statistical literature because you're not doing anything in an unbiased way, you're just walking across the graph, right? So you have um, how much bias you have depends on how much your walk ends up selecting things in an unbiased way. However, what this has shown, this is this class of um, sampling algorithms has been shown to work best in practice, right? Because it's walking over the graph structure and so it tends to produce a, a, a more representative graph structure than either of these other two. Yeah. Um, the, does it correct the problem of high degree bias? Or are you more likely to walk through somebody if they have? It depends on the structure of the graph because um, some graphs, the degrees of linked nodes are correlated. So if high degree <coughs> nodes are linked to other high degree nodes, then you'll sort of get trapped in this, like I'm going back and forth from high degree node to high degree node. So it kind of sort of depends. There's no, again, there's no theoretical analysis to really tell us. Um, in, in which structures it'll be less biased or more biased. Um, okay, so what we've done at this point is taken a step back and realized that the sampling process relies on two components. There's really the node selection process and there's the edge induction process, that um, how you decide which edges to put in between those selected nodes. And if you go back to my example with node selection, uh, because you are always downsampling the local neighborhood with any node, you're going to always underestimate that connectivity of that particular node. Okay, and so the like take nodes sampling as an example, you could have unbiased node selection, but then because you're doing graph induction at the at the next step, that's always going to have a bias. Right? So our idea is if you inject another bias in the opposite direction with respect to the node selection, that that would counter the bias of the graph induction process. Right? And so um, edge sampling itself has this bias with respect to picking high degree nodes, and, but it's never been combined with this induction process that nodes sampling does. Okay? So, uh, what we defined was this, uh, or what we developed was this new uh, method of graph sampling, which combines, which uses edge selection to select the nodes, but then does the same graph induction process that node sampling does. So we only use edge sampling to select the nodes, and then we add in all of the associated edges um, among the selected nodes. And we can show theoretically not that this is um, we can't show that this selects a representative sample yet, but we can show empirically it works better than the other algorithms. So again, we're, so we're sort of in the same case of what people have been doing so far, um, which is to show you these graphs <laughs> and show you the distributions here. So the black lines are the um, degree distribution, the clustering coefficient, and path length for some data set that I didn't actually put on the slide, so I can't tell you what it is, but it may be Facebook. Um, assume it's Facebook, um, and this uh, ties algorithm it here with the dotted line is what I just described, and you can see that actually the distributions are very close here to the black um, distributions, right? So we're getting closer than edge sampling are these red lines that are really far away. Um, node sampling are the green lines, which aren't really that close, and um, the topology sampling are these pink lines, right? So. So what we've shown so far is that we can think about the biases with respect to both the node selection and the edge induction process and try to use those in an intelligent way to offset each other to maybe come up with a better graph sampling algorithm. Um, but the um, more important thing to know, so even though we again have an algorithm that works empirically, 
really the foundation on which we evaluate these sampling algorithms is really very shaky, right? So there's, so there's really no good problem definition and no way to evaluate representativeness. Uh, so when people evaluate uh, the sub network, so you do you sample multiple sub networks and you compute the average yeah. distribution out. Uh, yes, yeah. So I was uh, glossing over that, but yes, you can think of these distributions here as averages of distributions, except for the black line, which was the original. Yeah. But the um, the more important issue that um, we're trying to work out right now is that it is unreasonable to think that this smaller subgraph is actually going to accurately represent the structure, accurately match the structure of the larger graph. Okay? Because if you think about these graph metrics, let me go back a second here. So let me give you a sort of loose um, view of where what we're thinking about now, if you again think that degree is bounded and it's not going to grow with graph size, then as on the smaller graphs, you might be able to exactly match the degree distribution. But if you think about path length, then that's that is expressing how many people are connected by a particular path length in the graph, right? So how many pe people are directly connected, how many people have a path of length 2, how many people have a path of length 3, right? So if you're going to keep a fixed bounded degree as you grow the graph larger, then what will happen is that the path lengths will grow, right? Because you can think of that as you add on more structure to the graph and everybody here that's already in the graph has their structure almost fixed. So you're just going to add on more stuff over here, which is going to increase the overall path lengths. Right? So you can't match this and this at the same time in a sample. Right? Alternatively, you can think you can match the path lengths on a smaller sample, meaning it's less connected, then you're not going to match the degree, right? because the degrees will have to be lower. Right? So at this point, what we're trying to show theoretically is that you can't possibly simultaneously match all these graph characteristics on a graph of a smaller size. And so the problem is ill-formed in that way in terms of how we're evaluating how the sampling algorithms are doing. And what instead we think that you should think about is that um, we should be explicitly considering the stochastic process of graph generation. Right? So Facebook itself is being is evolving over time and growing. And if you consider, um, if you make the strong assumption that the growth, that the patterns in the graph are stationary with respect to growth, then what you would really want is on your smaller graph to approximate the characteristics of what smaller graphs look like in that evolutionary process, right? So that would look like this, um, where there's some process that's growing these graphs of larger size, right? So there's some distribution over the sets of graphs at a particular size here with number of nodes, and now we have this distribution over all possible graphs we might have seen with, say, 10,000 nodes or, or 50,000 nodes, and this is the one we actually see which is the current Facebook, or the Facebook in 2008, actually. And then if we're going to sample some subsample of this graph to get us back to, say, this size, then we would want to say, is this um, sampled graph representative from this distribution of graphs we would have seen at that size? Right? So this may be the way that we want to formulate it theoretically, but the issue, problems with that are, first of all, we, can't, we don't have good models to actually specify probability distributions over all graphs of a particular size. So that would, have, that would be the other lecture I have to give you. Second of all, it's an open question what these generative processes are for graphs. So there's lots and lots of papers on people positing models for how graphs grow over time, like say the preferential attachment model or the Kronecker graphs. Right. And so it's unclear how to actually do this generative process over time. And so 
And let's say even that we could do this, we could specify this generative process, and we could model the probability distribution over graphs of a particular size. Still here, we're only going to get one example of a graph. So we're going to be, have to try to infer what this whole process is and the distribution at a particular size that's smaller than the size we have here based on our example of one graph. Right? So it's a very difficult, um, very difficult set of things to uh, sub-problems that you have to solve before we can even think about um, evaluating this. But I guess where we're at right now is to at least try to formulate what the problem would be and then try to figure out whether our indirect ways of evaluating it based on distributions are a reasonable proxy of this kind of process. And um, you know that's still an open question as to, as to how to do that, but I wanted to give you guys a sense of, of what we're thinking about. Um, okay, so I've talked too long on those sections, um, but any questions on that before I, yeah. Uh, this might be a long shot and everything. I'm just curious about it. So, in terms of graph sampling, for for like huge graphs like Facebook, where there are some patterns since like human beings are using and everything, like wouldn't big though of large numbers suggest that like eventually some highly dense cluster over Purdue here would uh, converge in distribution to some highly dense cluster in Stanford? Like for instance, a, a CS CS. Uh, the uh, graph of CS students in Purdue would most likely look like uh, the graph of CS students in Stanford in terms of like uh, like your graph similarity. Like so, in yeah. in that sense, like why are we doing edge or not not node sampling or like topography, but instead like just just uh, the graph cuts over some highly dense and some lowly dense uh, uh, graph subgraphs and then try to make up our own little Facebook. Like, I, it might be a long shot, I just do not understand why we're dealing with all the... No, so, so, no that's, a, so that's a very good idea. Um, so in general, I guess one of the, the versions of graph sampling that I didn't mention is um, called snowball sampling, which would be that you start at a seed and you just sort of grow out until you get to some point where you just, you know, stop growing, right? And um, in general, that has pro that's very biased because everything that was on your sort of last uh, last uh, element of your breadth for search uh, doesn't get any of its neighbors, right? So they have very biased um, characteristics. However, um, your idea of taking, say, you know, the Purdue network, um, it's is what I would call a contextual sample that's based on your affiliation with Purdue, which is exactly what we did, right? So we're taking the Purdue network, we're doing analysis on the Purdue network, as if that is is a, not even a sample, that that is an example of a graph, right? Which is the Purdue network. So, um, and what we're hoping is that subnetworks within Purdue are representative of, say, subnetworks that you'd see at Stanford. Um, that rely so so doing that of course I think is, is one of the better ways to go about um, uh, about doing this analysis now. But the main assumption there is that again that that's unbiased in some way and also that that is um, stationary, right? So this question of are is the Purdue network similar to um, to Stanford's network? That I think is an open question because people have a hard time, so they're, so these distributions that I showed you where we say, oh look, they're close, that's the closest I've seen to trying to measure this similarity <coughs> across these networks, because um, there's no real notion of, of how to measure a similarity, right? And there is one um, Facebook da data set that has been, um, I think it's been publicly released, but oftentimes when Facebook data is publicly released, it's retracted like a month later, so, uh, so I'll qualify that. But anyways, one of the data sets that I've uh, gotten through public release is a set of five different university networks. And I can't remember exactly what universities they were, but the size of, the, of those networks varied tremendously, right? So the difference between, say, Purdue with however many students we have, 40,000 students, compared to, say, Brown that has, you know, 
<laughs> let's say 2,000 students, 5,000 students, you know, that's a big difference, right? And, um, and so if you're at a small liberal arts school, maybe your connectivity with your friends is a lot different than if you're at a large urban school where people aren't actually forming a lot of friendships. So, um, so although I didn't bring it up in this talk, this notion of, so this assumption that we have stationary patterns throughout these graphs is another big assumption that we're making in, in all of our methods. And, um, and it's pretty clear that that's actually not true, right? That, um, that the Facebook network in North America probably looks different than the Facebook network in Africa, let's say, um, versus the Facebook network in Europe, um, versus a urban Facebook network versus a rural Facebook network, right? And so, um, so I think again that that is that's a, an open question. But um, so there was something else about your question though that I was going to address. Um, Like high events, low events, subgraphs, and merging. Yeah, so um, I guess, so the thing, I wanted to bring it back to actually this notion of weak dependence that I talked about in the first part of the talk, because a lot of people think that there are these sort of like cliffs in the graph, right, which would be the entropy changing or something where we would be able to cut there and it'd be okay because the thing on the other side of that cut is somehow different than, um, than the other side. And I think, again, that that's a notion that people intuitively have, and it relates to this idea of weak dependence. Right? So the stuff over here is not really tied to the stuff over here, so if we cut somewhere in the middle, those should be okay, right? We, we won't really have ignored dependencies um, that, we, that we should have considered, but it's, again, very tough to figure out how to formalize that um, and be able to say something um, without necessarily knowing this generative process of the network to be able to figure out where those places are to cut um, um, without having to do a lot of work looking at the data. So, um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's, a good way, it's a good way to think about it and I think the important question is try to actually, how to actually analytically formulate that question so that people can start to talk about the issues. So, I took enough time answering your question that I shouldn't go on to the third part of the talk, um, so I'll save that for the summer school for people to uh, hear about Tim's work, or maybe we'll make Tim give a, a, a STC seminar at some other point. Um, so I guess what I should do is just um, let me skip to the last slide that I had um, here to just wrap up for you. So overall, um, what I wanted to do, so this, this conclusion is a little bit related to the, to the um, part of the talk that you didn't see <laughs> uh, on distinguishing between social influence and homophily using randomization tests, but if you're interested about that, I'm happy to get to him and give you his paper um, and talk to you more about it. But basically, the high-level idea that I wanted to hit with this talk is that there's a lot of interesting work going on developing these models and algorithms to analyze these large data sets and uh, large social network data sets. And empirically, we've had a lot of, um, I guess, what people would call success, right? So we have algorithms that can find patterns, and we can show that we uh, can improve prediction using the uh, structure of the network. But um, if you actually uh, do more work thinking about the statistics of what's going on and the complications that come into play because we have this heterogeneous structure and interdependencies. We have some work showing that, uh, or I guess there's many different um, directions of our work that show that what this does is effectively increase the variance of the statistics that you might observe. And so a lot of the things that people have discovered as patterns might not actually be valid patterns if you take it into account the structure of the data in the right way. Okay? So thinking carefully about how to analyze um, and reason about the characteristics of these models and algorithms is actually going to, uh, is, is very important in order to trust the kinds of patterns that, that we discover in these data sets and use them to inform social science or, and or 
you know, marketing and um, systems like Facebook in terms of uh, their development. And so I'd say mo there sort of points to a lot of opportunities in this field that I would call computational social science, which um, has a big need for developing these um, complex statistical models that can predict behaviors in these dynamic, um, complex systems where we don't actually have multiple examples. We can just observe the system evolving over time. And there's uh, a, a lot of issues that I glossed over in terms of these trade-offs between accuracy of the models and efficiency of estimation or uh, prediction, and this large area of um, understanding the theoretical characteristics of, of the algorithms and um, how that impacts the interpretability and the trustability of the results that we get out. So I will stop there and um, escape any other questions you have now. Thanks. Thank you.